So, um, let me recall a few things about what we said yesterday. So if you remember, we ended up with the uh, following statement that when you consider um, lotka volterra type equations, um, which are related to uh, competition between two species, then uh, you have a structure uh, at the level of the right-hand side here, which makes it impossible to produce uh, Turing-like instability. And this is really uh, related to the, to the sign that you have in the, in the matrix when you linearize this around an equilibrium. So uh, because of this, the, uh, the Japanese team of uh, Shike Sada, Kawasaki, and Teramoto produced a more complicated model in which the effect of the presence of individuals of, let's say, the other species um, on, the, on the species you are looking at is that this uh, the individuals of these species are increasing the diffusion linearly with respect to the number of individuals of the, of the other species. And um, the, uh, the main property of, of this model is that, in fact, now, uh, because of this extra term here, you can produce Turing instability even uh, keeping the right-hand side uh, as it is, that is, a right-hand side coming out of, uh, of a competition model based on the lotka volterra equations. So let me uh, maybe first uh, explain, explain this to you before I start making uh, a priori estimates and, uh, and things like this. So I've taken uh, maybe... I will remove the, yeah, I think it's better this way. So I've, I've actually taken uh, a specific example with, uh, let's say, numbers. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not really possible to see on the blackboard with this. So I've taken this example in which, as you can see, I've selected uh, specific values for the coefficient uh, er, appearing in the in the competition terms. Um, plus, I've, as you can see, at this level, I've taken a certain coefficient alpha, which is a number, and which is called A12 in the, in the equations above. And finally, I've eliminated from the equations the coefficients A11, A22, which are called self-diffusion and which will play no role in what I will uh, uh, present now. And I've also eliminated the coefficient A21, um, which models the, the cross diffusion of the second species on the first one. So this is what I called previously a triangular model in which the cross diffusion is only from one species on the other and not in, in the reverse way. Okay? So it's really the, the most basic example you can build up uh, starting from the ideas of uh, Shikesada, Kawasaki, and Teramoto. So my claim is that for this model, uh, Turing instability uh, may indeed appear if uh, D1, D2, and alpha are chosen in the right way. So let me, let me try to, to show this to you. So the first thing is, consists in, uh, um, in uh, selecting uh, the coexistence equilibrium for the right-hand side, which is here. And as you can see, this amounts to solving the, the set of two equations. This is equal to this, and this is equal to this. And actually, the parameters are selected in such a way that this uh, solution is obvious. It's just u equal 1 and v equal 1. Okay? So you have 
the equilibrium for the ODE, which is just given by U0 V0 equal to 1, 1. And now, if you look at the, at the computation of stability from the point of view of the ODE for, for, for this equilibrium, you make the following computation. So you write U is equal to U0, which is 1, plus epsilon U1, plus something of order epsilon square, if you wish. And then the same for V. And you compute those two terms here. So as you can see, what you get is this. times 1 plus epsilon u1, and all of this with O of epsilon square. And for the second one, you end up with, I just forgot, no, that's okay. So it will be like this. Here you multiply by 1 plus epsilon v1. And when you compute this, of course, the terms of order 0 disappear because you have selected the, the equilibrium. And if you look at the terms of order 1 in epsilon, as you can see, uh, the only one which appears are this minus 3 half of u1 minus v1. So you get epsilon times minus 3 half of u1 minus v1 here, plus something of order epsilon square. Uh, for, and for the second one, you get epsilon times minus 5 over 9 u1 minus 4 over 9 v1 plus epsilon square. Okay. So, let me check. Yes, that's okay. Um, so, as a consequence, you can now write the matrix, the two by two matrix, which is associated to this, to this computation. Let's put it here. And I called this matrix B in the previous. Uh, uh, course. So B here is now this minus 3 half, minus 1, minus 5 over 9, and 4 over 9, like this. And as you can see, minus, sorry. So as previously, you have only minus signs inside the matrix. So now you, you compute the trace, and it is obviously less than 0. And when you compute the determinant, uh, what you get is the following. So you have 12 over 18 minus 5 over 9, which is 10 over 18. So this gives you exactly 1 over 9. And this is strictly positive, so that you're sure to have a stable point a stable equilibrium point from the point of view of the ODEs, okay? So this gives you uh, two eigenvalues which have negative real parts. And so U0, V0 is a stable equilibrium for the ODE. Now the point is that uh, this equilibrium will not be stable for the, for the PDE, for the PDE written above, of course, that is the one with the cross diffusion. Um, and in order to see that, it's enough to show that one mode is, is unstable in terms of uh, functions of x, 
and we will select, as previously, the cosine, which has the, moreover, the property of uh, taking uh, its derivative takes value zero at point zero and pi, so that if you add uh, Neumann boundary conditions uh, on an interval zero pi, the, the mode that I will select will satisfy them, and so you can really then uh, select this interval, um, use the Neumann boundary condition, and for example, do the, com do the computation on the computer because you have a, a, a system which is completely closed, okay? So I will not rewrite that on, on, on the blackboard, but keep in mind that what I will do is really compatible with reasonable boundary conditions. So uh, the perturbation that we will use now is not just one plus epsilon u1 with u1 uh, independent on x, but the same multiplied by the cosine of x, okay? So now, If we look at perturbations like, so u is 1 plus epsilon u1 cos x plus something of order epsilon square, and the same for v. And we plug this in the, in the PDE above. Uh, it's clear that the, what will happen at the level of the right-hand side will be exactly uh, the same as what we already computed. Uh, the only point being that the cosine of x will appear on, on the right-hand side. And uh, from the point of view of the of the left-hand side of the equation. Uh, let's let's compute it briefly. So let's divide by epsilon in order to write just one line. So now if you if you plug the the ansatz which is here and here inside uh, this term, it's clear that you will end up with dt u1 plus d1 u1 uh, times cos x minus alpha, well, let's, let's write it directly. Uh, plus alpha times u1 plus u2 times cos x. Indeed, the, remember that the second derivative in x, when you use it on cos x, is just, it just gives you minus cos x, okay? So the, the, the d1 here, minus d1 becomes d1 at this level, and here, you take the second derivative of this, and when you multiply u by v, and you look at what happens at order epsilon, this consists just, in fact, in making the sum of u1 and v1. Okay, so sorry, this is not u2, it's like yesterday. This is v1. And... Uh, is it minus alpha or plus Sorry, it's plus because you have a minus here. So since... Uh, Second derivative exchange the signs in the cosine, you get really this. And, uh, and of course, if you do the same for the second one, it's even simpler. And what you get is just is just dt uh, v1 plus d2 v1. And you can write all of this I, I forgot about the cosine. Okay. Oh. 
So now if you write all of this in terms of uh, U1 and V1, you end up with dt U1 and V1 is equal to the matrix A, which will be made of uh, minus D1, minus D2 here. Uh, as you can see, you also have um, minus alpha here, and you have finally minus alpha here. So it will be like that, plus the matrix which is due to the right hand side, which was already computed, and which is uh, here, so that is B, times U1, V1, plus something of order epsilon, okay? So now if you, if you look at the matrix that you obtain here, so I, I, I just produce now the, really the sum of the, of the two matrices, um, this gives you minus D1, minus alpha, minus three half, minus alpha, minus one, minus five over nine, minus four over nine, and as usual, you only have minus signs uh, everywhere. But now the difference with, with what happened previously is that uh, since you have an extra term here, uh, when you will compute the determinant, it will be a little more complicated. Uh, let me first say that it's obvious that the trace of this matrix, so this matrix I call A plus B, okay, A being this one. So it's clear that the, the trace of A plus B is negative. Okay, I think it's completely clear. I missed the D2 here, you're right, thanks. Oops. It's even more negative now. <laughs> so the, now the determinant is a little more complicated uh, to compute. So let's start with the part in which you have only uh, numbers. This was already computed, and we obtained 1 over 9, if you remember. Okay. Then you have to add uh, D1, D2. Okay. You also have to add uh, D2 times uh, 3 half. Like this. You also have uh, D2 times alpha coming from here. And you have 4 over 9 times D1. This one was already taken into account in the 1, 9 over 9 that was, uh, that was written here. And you finally have minus this times this. And this is the only sign in which you get a minus, and it's minus 5 over 9 alpha. Sorry, I, I forgot one. No, no, uh, I think it's okay. Sorry, the, you mean this one? It's because I, yeah? I think I said it. <laughs> Plus D2 times alpha. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so it's a plus, okay. Yeah. So everything is made in such a way that here you still get something which is negative. So that's the point. Um, okay, so let me rewrite it maybe uh, like this. So 1 over 9 plus d2 minus 1 over 9 alpha plus d1 times 4 over 9 plus d2, so like this. So is it okay, d1? Okay, those ones are the ones containing d1. 
uh, 1 over 9, and here it's alpha times this is minus 1 over 9 and plus d2. That's OK. So as you can see, now the whole point is, is it possible to get something which is uh, uh, negative out of this formula? And the only negative term you, you, you can use is actually this one. Okay, so the first thing you can do is to say, well, let's choose d1 extremely small in such a way that this term can be neglected. Okay, so we take d1 very small. And then, well, No, I, sorry, this one is minus 1 over 9 alpha. So here I forgot something. Ah, there is 3 over 2 d2. So actually, this is not uh, d2. Okay. It's a nightmare. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but it will still work, fortunately. <laughs> okay, so, so this one can be neglected. Uh, and then you can see that uh, things will work only if uh, d2 minus 1 over 9 is, uh, is negative, okay? So you have to select... Um, D2, which is uh, small in front of 1 over 9, let's say less than 1 over 9. And uh, then you can see that here you have a number, here you have another number, okay, once you have selected D2 in this way. This one is at worst 3 over 2 times 1 over 9. And then if you take alpha large enough, it's clearly okay. So then you take alpha large enough and you get that the determinant of A plus B is clearly negative and this means that you have one eigenvalue which, have, uh, which will be positive and the other eigenvalue which will be negative. And so you have instability in the PDE. So this is just one example, but actually, if you select other uh, numbers, you can see that it always works in the same way, that is, at the very end, it's really important that uh, you take D1 and D2 not too large, so the usual diffusion should be not too large, in front of the unusual diffusion, this coefficient alpha. So somehow, uh, instability uh, will occur only if you have a cross diffusion which is in some sense dominant with respect to the standard diffusion. And that is the, that is the whole point here. I mean, that is the, uh, this, uh, this model, which is called now SKT, for Shige Sada, Kawasaki, Teramoto, it's really something which works if you take the cross diffusion large enough. Okay, so I hope that I uh, convinced you uh, that this model really uh, solves the problem of obtaining patterns out of a system in which you have only competition. So let's come back to the slides a little.
So here is the pattern, the Turing pattern that I showed yesterday, and this is really what, what you can see when you do the numerical computations. So here, uh, imagine that you are now in 2D, where all the computations here were made in 1D, but you can do it, you can do all of them in 2D, actually. And uh, typically, what you obtain is a situation in which you have one of the species which is dominant in part of the space, like for uh, the part which is red here, and the other species which is dominant in another part of the space, like in yellow here. Uh, you can get very complicated bifurcation diagrams, but I already said a few words about this uh, yesterday, and I will not uh, say too much about bifurcations today. Let me now um, point out that there was, uh, there was uh, at some point a uh, kind of, uh, uh, how to say, let's say some people complained about, about this model uh, because of the, of the following feature. Um, so some people argued that when you say uh, let's, uh, let's uh, add a term in the, in the rural uh, reaction diffusion equation, let's add a term of cross diffusion, um, which somehow says that if there are a large number of individuals of the other species, you, uh, you increase the diffusion rate of the first species. But this can be, do, this can be done sorry, uh, either inside the Laplacian, like here, or uh, by taking this, this form here, in which you consider that the diffusion rate is what is in, uh, in front of the gradient rather than what is inside the Laplacian. Okay? And it's not completely obvious to understand if uh, this would be uh, better suited to the, to the modeling uh, assumptions than this. And actually, of course, if you, if, you write, if, you, if you start to expand this, you can really write it as this term here, plus an extra term, which you can somehow um, consider as a term in which you will uh, be uh, drifting in the opposite direction to the gradient of V. So somehow to write things in this way uh, implicitly says that you have a drift of the first species, of the individuals of the first species, according to the, to, the, to the gradient that they see on the other species. And this is really exactly what you wanted to avoid in this model. That is to say that the individuals of the species U uh, can measure somehow the gradient of the uh, density of the individuals of the species V. Because of course, to measure a gradient is very complicated. And so even though you didn't do that uh, explicitly, it's still implicit inside the equation, okay? And then, of course, if those are two different effects, that is an effect in which you increase the diffusion and an, and an effect in which you, you try to go against the gradient of the other species, there is no reason why you should put exactly the same coefficient in front. So why write writing this and not this plus two times this, let's say, okay? So, uh, because, of this, because of this issue, um, the, the same Japanese group, but now it's uh, Iida, Izuara, Mimura, and Inomiya, but in fact they are really uh, coming from the, from the same team. Uh, they, they sort of provided an answer to this uh, modeling question. And so they did it very clearly in the specific case that we just uh, uh, considered. That is a case in which you have no self-diffusion and you have the cross-diffusion only in one of the equations, the so-called triangular case, okay? In which you have the standard diffusion for the, for the second equation, but you have the cross-diffusion here. And they, they said, well, let's not discuss too much about, about this issue in this sort of abstract way. Let's provide um, a microscopic model um, which in some limit will end up uh, in, in, in this model, and if you believe in this microscopic model, then uh, the formal limit, at least, and maybe the regress limit, will uh, ensure that you have written the right model at the end. Okay. And I think it's a very intelligent way of answering those questions which are not really mathematical questions. Okay. And uh, so the, the model that they, that they proposed uh, is based on the following idea. Uh, let's say that 
the, if you look at a very small time scale with respect to the time scale which appears here, uh, the individuals of the species U can be found in two different states, which are called uh, quiet and stressed. So UA will uh, denote the number density of individuals of species U in the quiet state, and UB will denote the same in the stressed state. And individuals may, may switch from one state to the other with a very uh, small scale of time, so they can become stressed or quiet very quickly according to the presence in their surroundings of individuals of the, of the other species. So that, in some sense, when they see that there are a lot of individuals of the other species which are competing with them, they can go from quiet to stressed. Okay? And then they come back to quiet after some time. And this time is very small in front of the time of evolution of the, uh, of the birth and death rate uh, and of the diffusion rate that are here, okay? So with all those assumptions, you end up with a model which is written here and which in fact is also written on the, on, on the blackboard on, on the right-hand side, on the upper blackboard of the right-hand side. Uh, but in, on the blackboard, I, I, I wrote everything with uh, parameters epsilon, which are explicitly written for UA, UB, and V, whereas here it is not explicitly written and I think it's a little more readable on the, on, on the slide. So, uh, let's say that in, in this microscopic model, um, the, the, the last equation is exactly the same as previously, except that instead of u, you put the sum of the u, the individuals of the species u which are stressed, plus those which are quiet, okay? And it's all of this which appears in the term of competition with the individuals of species V. And then, if you look at the equations for uh, UA and UB, which represent quiet and stressed individuals, the first thing you say is that the, the fact that the individuals are stressed is seen on their diffusion rate. Somehow, when they are stressed, they really increase their diffusion rate, and here, it is, it, is, it is made in such a way that this appears as a constant parameter, and so it doesn't matter if it is inside or outside the Laplacian, okay? So here, alpha is a constant, it does not depend on V, so you can put it here or inside and doesn't matter at all. So there is no controversy about this thing here, okay? So that's the first thing, the, the stressed individual will diffuse a little uh, uh, a little more than, than the other ones. Then you write down here the terms of competition, and once again, the only thing that you change is that you consider that the individuals of, of, uh, in the states A and B compete with all the individuals of the species U with, this, with the same rate S11. So this is quite natural. Uh, this is multiplied by UA and UB because those are rates. And finally, the most important term is the one which, has, which appears with a 1 over epsilon in front. And this 1 over epsilon is really um, appearing here because we say that the time scale for this microscopic model is very small with respect to the time scale on which U and V evolve. And so you have to put a very large rate here, meaning that this, this is a, a process which goes on very quickly. And then what you put inside here is just an exchange between UA and UB, uh, meaning that uh, quiet individuals can become stressed or stressed ones can become quiet. And this equilibrium is something which depends on functions H and K, which depend on the number of individuals of the, of, of the second species. And H and K are not yet chosen at this level, but let's say that the probability of going from quiet to stressed is something which depends on V, and the same for going from stressed to quiet. And so because of this, you can see that uh, uh, the number of stressed uh, individuals will really depend on the, on, the, on the number of individuals of species V in the surrounding. And so you can expect that because of this, the cross-diffusion will appear at the end when you let epsilon go to zero. 
So that is the interpretation of all of this. And so, if you now you believe in this microscopic model, which is something which can be discussed, of course, um, if you now let epsilon go to zero and you recover the original system, then you're fine, because you have, in some sense, shown that this is uh, compatible with the modeling hypothesis, the modeling assumptions that you made at the very beginning. I hope you are convinced by that. I was convinced. <laughs> so the whole point now is to let epsilon go to zero, and first to try to see at the formal level if you re really recover at the end the original SKT cross-diffusion model. So, uh, when you have epsilon like this in the equation, the first thing to do is to uh, take, let's say, the first equation. So you, you write the, just the first equation. Uh, remember that the, the system is still writ is written on the upper part of the, of the right-hand side uh, blackboard. So you can really have a look at it when you, if you don't remember what it is. Uh, so you just look at the first equation, the one which is here. And you, you multiply by epsilon, and you say that what is here is just epsilon times the rest, that is this uh, minus this. And if you assume that uh, UA epsilon, UB epsilon, V epsilon are bounded in some space, maybe uh, a negative Sobolev space, uh, then this quantity should be of order epsilon. Okay? And then, uh, you want an equation at the end on the quantity which is ua epsilon plus ub epsilon. So the only reasonable thing to do is to add the two equations which appear now up there, so the one for ua and the one for ub. And since the, the terms which are here and here, that is the, uh, the terms which uh, enable individuals to go from quiet to stressed, uh, cancel when you, when you add the two equations, you end up with the equation which is written here, that is dt of ua plus ub minus Laplacian of... So here you have d1 times ua plus ub plus alpha times ub, which comes from this extra diffusion rate that you add when the individuals are stressed. Okay? And then you get the usual uh, competition term here. And of course here, epsilon has disappeared completely. And for the last one, you just, you just keep what you had. That is the equation which is written here. You just keep it as it is. Okay. And now the whole point is to use the equation that you have here. In the limit, this will give you zero here. And you will try to write ub in terms of ua plus ub in this limit. So this is exactly what is done in this slide. So now you suppose that all the quantities with epsilon converge to something. This is a formal limit. Uh, you write the, at the end, you have this equilibrium between UA and UB, because this quantity was like capital O of epsilon. And you can rewrite this uh, in this way, in which UB is explicitly returned in terms of UA plus UB. And now you pass to the limit in the two equations which were written, sorry, in the two equations which were written here and here. And since epsilon does not appear anywhere here, you can just pass to the limit directly, hoping that everything goes well. And you end up with this. Okay. So you, on V, you have an equation which is quite okay if you call this U. And here you can see that if you call this U again, this will be okay, this will be okay, this one also, this one also. And in this one, you will have u here, and in front, you will have something which depends on v. So, if you do that, you call u equal ua plus ub, you end up, for the first equation, exactly with this. That is, you have the, the, what, you, what you hoped to, to get for the reaction term. The same for v. For v, there is no problem, everything goes well. And inside the diffusion, now at this point, you see that you have the standard diffusion plus this strange diffusion here, in which you have a function of v in front of u. And now if you select h and k, which was not 
This is something which was not done previously. So now you select H and K in such a way that this quantity is equal to what you wish, that is A1 to V. But then you get the original SKT, which is not written anymore. Sorry, it's written here. <laughs> so what you get is the original SKT model without self-diffusion and in the triangular case. Okay? And as you can see, you really get that UV is inside the Laplacian and it's not gradient of V times gradient. It's not divergence of V times gradient U. It's really everything inside the Laplacian. And so in some sense, this ends the controversy provided that you believe in the microscopic model. Okay? Yeah. So actually, that's, uh, that's work, work in progress, <laughs> I would say. So there is uh, one guy from the Japanese team uh, tried to do that, but it's not completely convincing from my point of view for various reasons. And uh, I think that Thomas is also, uh, is also looking <laughs> quite thoroughly into, into this. Um, let's say that in any way, it's, uh, then it's both a matter of modeling and of mathematics. From the modeling point of view, uh, it's not completely obvious to find something which is convincing. But then, of course, if it helps you for, for getting uh, existence for the final model, you don't really care if the modeling is not, is not the right one. So there are various routes, let's say, <laughs> various possibilities, uh, ones which are really trying to, to, to be as close to the models as possible, and other ones which are more from mathematical point of view to just find um, microscopic systems, which in the limit gives you the right system, and which helps you to uh, approximate your final system in the right way. Okay. Can't be much more precise about this, because this is really still completely work in progress. Okay, so then, of course, once people have uh, obtained the formula symptotics, they want to show that it is rigorous. And uh, so the, the Japanese group provided a certain number of papers about this issue. And um, let me uh, cite those two papers here, um, which are rather recent, in fact. And in, 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 in one of those papers, you have this, uh, this uh, what I would call an if theorem, which is a little better than the formal asymptotics. It tells you that if you know a priori that um, all the quantities are uniformly bounded with respect to epsilon in L infinity, then you can pass to the limit uh, rigorously. Okay. But then, of course, one has to show that those a priori estimates uh, are, are true. And up to my knowledge, there is no setting in which uh, uh, someone really was able to show that. So it still remains, it's a little better than completely formal, but it's not yet a theorem with non-empty hypothesis, let's say. And there is a second result, which concerns this time only stationary solutions, and uh, this is directly related to the bifurcation diagram that I briefly showed you. That is, somehow, the Japanese team, they were able to prove at the, at the numerical level that the bifurcation diagram for a given epsilon converges to the bifurcation diagram for epsilon equal to zero. Uh, at least in a, in, in a, for a certain set of parameters and, uh, uh, um, let's say, with a, with a certain number of assumptions. But this is really convincing when you see the pictures. It's really very convincing. And so it's something which also has to do with the Turing instability because it tells you basically that um, for this model at a given epsilon, for epsilon small but not zero, uh, you, you already have Turing instability in this model. And this Turing instability, in some sense, uh, is kept when epsilon goes to zero. And it's the reason why you have the Turing instability in the, in, the, in, the, in the final model. And from my point of view, it's quite interesting to see that there are models which are linear plus quadratic in which you have Turing instability, because the traditional theory of, of Turing instability is that you need something cubic in the right-hand side in order to get the Turing instability. So the reason why this is not contradictory is that in the traditional theory of Turing instability, you look only at two equations, whereas here you have a system of three equations. 
So somehow now the idea is that if you look at a system with two equations, you need a cubic uh, term in the right-hand side. But if you, if you accept to have three equations, you can really do with quadratic things. So actually, it's not completely obvious that this is quadratic, uh, but it becomes so if for k and, and h, you select something which is affine, which is something that you can do, in fact. OK, so that was just... Um, that was just... Uh, uh, yeah. I would say so, but uh, there is no no hint about that. But it's something which can be looked at because it's, I mean, it's only elementary computation. As, as long as you just look for the onset of Turing instability, you don't have really to do analysis. I mean, you can just do what I did here. I mean, doing computation. So it's something which could be looked at maybe more thoroughly. But of course, I mean, people who are really experimenting with uh, chemicals and things like that, we will tell you that it's already extremely difficult to do it with two, two products. So to try to do it with three is like crazy. So it's more, maybe something more for mathematicians than for practitioners. So what I wanted to do now, in the time which remains, is to explain a result that I got together with Ariane Trescazes. Uh, so this is, the, this is a, a theorem which tells you the following. So you have a lot of parameters, just remember that they all have to be strictly positive. And then you select H and K, like in the, in the formal asymptotics, which are functions which are, let's say, C1, and which are strictly, uh, which are bounded below by something which is strictly positive. And you define a, a function phi as this quantity here minus du, but you will see in the, in the SQL uh, how it works. And you take initial data which are in reasonable spaces, which I will not uh, comment. Then the first thing is that you write, you write here uh, the microscopic model in a case which is a sort of um, extension of, of what was proposed by uh, Shigesada, Kawasaki, and Teramoto, in which you replace the, uh, the logistic terms by things with arbitrary powers. So you have powers A, B, C, and D here, which can be arbitrary. Uh, and you take initial data which are adapted. I don't want to say too much about this uh, either. Um, plus Neumann boundary conditions. And so the first thing is that for a given epsilon, there are uh, strong solutions to this problem. But the more important thing is the following, that provided that the, that the coefficients that you have in the, in the powers appearing in the, in, in the competition terms, so I have a certain pr properties, but this includes the original case in which everything is equal to one. Um, then when epsilon go to zero, up to extraction of a subsequence, the solution of the microscopic problem indeed rigorously converge towards the solution of the uh, final problem, which in this extended case looks like this, that is you still have A, B, C, and D here. And you have here the function phi, which is defin defined according to h and k previously, and which can be phi of v is equal to v, like in the original system. Uh, and so, uh, let's say, yeah, so I said that this convergence is in fact almost everywhere. So somehow we were able to get the uh, rigorous limit for the, for the formal computation that I uh, presented to you and to extend it uh, to a larger class of uh, powers here. Remember that in the logistic equation, the fact that you have a power one is not really something which is um, very, um, uh, very convincing, let's say, in the modeling. That is, you could put any kind of function which has a reasonable behavior instead. Uh, okay, and, and you get, of course, the normal boundary condition and the initial data that you have provided for the system. So let's say in this, with this result, uh, we can 
rigorously show what I presented previously, plus extend it to uh, other cases. I don't want to comment too much about the possibilities, but there are various uh, possibilities in the powers here. Let's see. Uh, and as a consequence of this, then we get a result of existence for the final system in which you can recognize the powers, the function phi, and this goes like this. So you take any smooth bounded domain of Rn, you take uh, strictly positive coefficients in the system, you have to have this um, one of these two conditions on the, on the powers A, B, C, and D, but this contains the original one. Uh, you take a function phi here, which has a certain number of property, but which includes the function phi of V is equal to V. You start from initial data, which are uh, well uh, uh, adapted to the problem, but be careful that here the initial data is not in L infinity for U initial, and so we don't get an L infinity bound for U, which means that we could not apply the semi-formal theorem of the Japanese because we, it needed L infin uniform in epsilon L infinity bounds. So this is a method which is really different from, the, from what they, they, they looked at uh, a few years ago. Uh, and then we get a weak solution to this, a weak solution which lies in, uh, in a certain LP space for U and in L infinity for V with Neumann boundary condition and the initial data. So actually, this approximation procedure, which really came from modeling issues, it is also a way of getting uh, uh, existence of solutions for the, for the problem, which is, I think, uh, unexpected. Actually, there is a long list of papers which, in which uh, people try to get existence in uh, more and more uh, general versions of the SKT system, so I've quoted here uh, a certain number of them. Um, as you can see, uh, the first papers were really dealing with low dimensions, which means that there were Sobolev embeddings which were used in the proofs, and it's really something we wanted to avoid here in order to get a proof which is really independent of, of, of the dimension of the problem. And then there were also a certain number of results, more recent ones actually, in which um, there is a certain number of uh, assumptions on the diffusion rates, and we also wanted to avoid uh, all of this. Uh, let's say that our paper is closest to this last paper, which is due to Yamada, in which actually one of the cases that we provided was, uh, was done. Actually, not exactly, because it's uh, strictly bigger, or, or instead of... Uh, bigger of equal, but it's, let's say this is really close to the paper of Yamada in this case. So this is just to give you an idea of the interest which, uh, uh, in which mathematicians had in this, in this model. Okay, so let's stop maybe with the slides, and I will now devote the last 30 minutes to give you an idea of the proof. So this will become a little more technical, and I apologize in advance. Uh, but I think it's, it's really the point here is really to give you a flavor of the technical proof because it's based on arguments which I think can be used in many other situations. So let's, let's start maybe from, let's start from this one. So I will, uh, in fact, do the proof in a slightly simplified case with respect to the theorem which was, uh, which was proposed and for which the computations are a little simpler. So I will consider the system which is here, but with a certain number of simplifications. So actually, I will take systematically one for the, 
for the parameters in such a way that uh, this is a little easier to write down. Okay. Um, let me check. I will maybe use uh, slightly different notations for the diffusion rate. So this one I will call dA. This one I will call dA plus dB. Like this. And this one I will call dV. And uh, so I add Neumann boundary condition, which I do not write down, plus initial boundary, con in, sorry, initial conditions, which are independent on epsilon. So this means that I will consider that this quantity is U initial, if you wish, U A initial, the same for u epsilon b and the same for v so the point is that the initial datum does not depend on epsilon here uh, finally i will consider uh, I will write it maybe on the, on the board here. Finally, I will consider H and K, which are such that uh, H is between two bounds, and the same for K. the bound below being strictly positive. And I will also suppose that their derivatives is bounded. Or more precisely, this is the absolute value of their derivatives. So those are the assumptions uh, that I will, I will consider. And remember that uh, in, in this, uh, in this um, setting, uh, the parameters dA, dB, and dV are all strictly positive. They are diffusion rates. So this is a setting which is, of course, uh, um, simplified with respect to the complete theorem, but this is enough to understand the, the basics of the proof. So the, the idea, as always in, uh, in, in PDEs, consists in trying to get uh, a priori estimates for the, for the problem. And since it is a problem which depends on epsilon, in which you have a singular limit with respect to epsilon, those a priori estimates have to be independent on epsilon. Un tout petit aparté en français, donc en, les EDP, c'est exactement le contraire de l'existentialisme, c'est-à-dire que c'est l'essence qui précède l'existence et pas l'existence qui précède l'essence. C'est-à-dire on on commence par démontrer les propriétés des objets et ça permet de démontrer qu'ils existent et c'est pas le contraire. D'accord Okay, sorry for this uh, for this very little uh, thing in French that I could not really say in English. Um, so so the point is to get a priori estimates uh, which are independent on uh, on epsilon. So the first thing, when you, want, when you have a system and you want to get a priori estimates which do not depend on epsilon, but you have one over epsilon in part of the system, is to try to uh, get combinations which do not depend on this one over epsilon. So here, the only thing you can do, as you can see, is to add the first and the second equation. Okay? Because if you do that, the one over epsilon cancels. 
cancel, sorry, and uh, you end up with something in which one row epsilon is not, is not present. So the first thing, so let's call it A, consists in writing the equation for, for this quantity. And as you can see, what you get is the following. So this is the diffusion part. And in the reaction part, only the first part is present. And what you get is exactly this. And so now, in order to get something out of this, you first observe that since you do not have the same quantity here and here, there are, there are very few uh, possibilities of doing something with the Laplacian except integrating it on the whole domain omega and eliminating it thanks to the boundary conditions, which are the Neumann boundary condition in this case. So what you do now is you just integrate over omega. Remember that here all the quantities are positive, okay? Because both are concentrations. Ua epsilon, Ub epsilon, and V epsilon. So you integrate it, and what you get is, is the following. So this one is coming from the one, and then you have minus something, Okay, so let's write maybe just the first one, which is Ua epsilon plus Ub epsilon to the square. And for the one which concerns V epsilon, I just, uh, I just use uh, a minus here, okay? I eliminate it. So thanks to this, you immediately see that there are two estimates which are coming out of this, uh, of this inequality. First, if you remove this term which has the right sign, you see that the derivative of this is less than this, and thanks to Grunwald's lemma, so you use Grunwald's lemma, you get that the, su the supremum on a given time interval of Ua epsilon plus Ub epsilon dx is bounded. And it is bounded by something which depends on time, but not epsilon, okay? And then, once you know this, you just uh, now integrate with respect to time uh, the inequality which is here, keeping the term which is here, and you, you move it from here to the other side of the equation, and what you get is that the integral, which is now with respect to both time and space, of Ua epsilon plus Ub epsilon to the square dx, dt, this is also less than a constant which depends only on capital T. Oops, should not do that. <laughs> So, uh, thanks to this, you immediately get the, uh, uh, the simple a priori estimates for Ua and Ub. And they tell you that Actually, both Ua and Ub, since they are positive, huh? both Ua, or non-negative at least, both Ua and Ub actually are bounded. So the first one tells you that this is bounded in L infinity in the time variable on 0t with value in L1 of omega in the x variable. And the second one, tells you that this is bounded in L2 in both variables on 0t times omega. 
Okay. So this is the basic a priori estimate for UA epsilon and UB epsilon. And you see that this is bounded means that this does not, the norms do, do not depend on epsilon. That's the whole point. Then you try to get as much as possible from the equation that you have on V. Now, the equation on V is a little different, as you can see here, because uh, you do not have any one or epsilon in the equation on V, so it's much easier. The first thing you can do is the following. Uh, you say, well, those terms are uh, non-positive, so I can eliminate them from the, from the equation, keeping uh, 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 an, a less or equal sign here. So, what you see is that dt v epsilon minus dv Laplacian of v epsilon is less or equal than v epsilon. The epsilon are always above here. Uh, which you can rewrite if you look at the equation satisfied by exponential minus t v epsilon. This is the same as writing dt of exponential minus t v epsilon minus dv Laplacian of exponential minus t v epsilon is less than zero. OK? And now, this is a standard property of the heat equation that if you have a non-negative function inside and uh, uh, less or equal here, uh, the, the maximum principle tells you that uh, this quantity in L infinity norm at time t is inferior, is less than the same quantity at time zero. So this implies by maximum principle, but this one is really one of the easiest maximum principles uh, that you can write for, for a parabolic PDE. This is really, for example, if you are on an interval or if you are on the, on the wall set air, you can really look just at the uh, elementary solution of the heat equation, and you can see it on that. Uh, so this tells you that V epsilon will be bounded in L infinity for any time uh, capital T. Okay. Actually, this bounds grows exponentially with time, uh, at least if you do it this way. If you do it a little more intelligently, you can also remove that. But anyway. So, we end up at the end with one bound on V epsilon and uh, one bound on UA epsilon, UB epsilon. like this, and this is already enough to say that up to extraction, you can pass to the limit in UA epsilon, UB epsilon, and V epsilon in uh, weak topologies. So, So according to what is shown on the upper blackboard, <coughs> you can show the following up to extraction. There exists UA, UB in L infinity in time with value in L1, in X, in L2, and in L2 of Tx, and V in L infinity of Tx. Actually, this is local in time. That is, this is on, on given intervals in time. Let me write this. 
so local in time, such that you have weak convergence of all the terms which appear in this problem, that is, UA epsilon, UB epsilon, and V epsilon. And the weak convergence holds in the same spaces as here, and of course, when it is an infinity, it is weak star. Okay. So let's say weakly, weakly in both spaces, and this is weak star for L infinity. So you've done the first part, if you wish, of the proof, which consists in already getting some, some bounds which are independent on epsilon and show that you, that you can get weak limits uh, out of it. Uh, in order to, to, to move forward, um, you need to know a little more on, uh, on, the, on the properties of the heat equation and uh, the, the way to do this is the following. So, then you observe that since now you know that UA plus UB is in L2, you see that thanks to the third equation, dT V epsilon minus dV Laplacian V epsilon, this quantity is in fact living in a bounded set of L2 in both times and space. So it's L2 of 0t times omega, okay? Because you already know that this one is in L2, and you know that this one and this one are in L infinity, okay? So you make L infinity times L2, you get L2. And now the maximal regularity uh, uh, theorem for the heat equation tells you that uh, this ensures that all second order derivatives in X and the derivative in time of the epsilon are also bounded in the same space. So this ensures that dt v epsilon and dxi xj v epsilon, they are also bounded in L2. Uh, for those of you who may have uh, a doubt about this, let me do a very simple proof. So, if you know that dt a minus uh, d Laplacian a is equal to f, which is in L2, what you do is you just multiply by the Laplacian of a, like this, and then you integrate in x. So for the first term, you can do an integration by parts, and it will give you gradient a, dt of gradient a, but this is exactly dt of gradient a to the square divided by two. Okay, so what you get is really this quantity here, when you integrate in omega and you do an integration by parts. And next one is minus d integral of Laplacian a to the square. And the last one is integral of f Laplacian a, but you can use Cauchy-Schwarz on, on this one, or even Young. So if you use Young inequality, you will say that this quantity is, uh, uh, can be uh, bounded by, let's say, d over 2 times this one, plus 1 over 2d, the integral of f square. Okay. I just used ab less than uh, d over 2a square plus, two d plus 1 over 2d b square. I hope it's okay. Uh, Sorry. 
Okay, let's remove this. And then once you're here, you, you use this uh, 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 when you take the integral in time of this quantity, and what you end up with is that the integral from zero to t of Laplacian a to the square dx dt is less than a constant, which depends on d now, times the integral of f square. So now you just integrate in t this quantity and you use the inequality here. This is exactly two times this one, so this one disappears and it remains only the L2 norm of f square. Okay, and you get this. So this is not exactly saying the same as the fact that all uh, second order derivatives of A are bounded, but in fact, there is a small trick, which is that this is nothing but the, now you, you take the, what is the, the Laplacian is just the sum over i of dx i square, so like this, and to the square, so you can write it in this way, okay. And now you do two integration by parts. One uh, in which you take the xi which is here and you put it here, and one in, in which you take the xj here and you put it here, okay? And so you get at the end the sum over i and j of the dxi xj a times the same, that is square. And so if this one is bounded, this one is also bounded, and this is just the sum over all possible i and j of the quantities which are here, okay? It remains to show that the derivative with respect to time is bounded, but then that's, that's uh, clear, because once you know that this one is bounded in L2, this one is just the sum of this one and this one, and it is also bounded in L2, okay? So I hope I convinced you that on V epsilon, we have that dt v epsilon and dx i x j v epsilon are bounded. Uh, then, next step uh, consists in saying that, in fact, if you look at dx i v epsilon, it is uh, bounded, it is in a bounded set of L4. in 0t times omega. So this one is a consequence of an interpolation between the fact that the dxi, xj are in L2 and v epsilon itself is in L infinity. So when you interpolate between the two, you see that the first derivative is inside the zero derivative and the second derivative, and you have L infinity L2, and when you take the interpolation of this, you end up in L4. It is also something which can be done uh, elementarily, but it's a little too late for that. Uh, and this is, so those, uh, those things, this one and it has to be this one, yes, and this one, they are the a priori estimate that you can get on V epsilon. And at this level, it's in some sense, uh, all what you can do by elementary ways is finished. You have in hand all the a priori estimates which are in some sense obvious because they correspond to things that you traditionally do whenever you have singular limit problems in PDEs. So you know that uh, UA epsilon and UB epsilon are weakly converging uh, in L2, basically, towards their limit. You know that V epsilon is much more regular because you have estimates on its derivatives. And so 
by a compactness, uh, by a strong compactness argument, uh, let's say Relish theorem, you will get that the epsilon converges strongly towards its limit at this point. Okay, so the 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 end of all this business. No, this one is that thanks to Relish theorem. V epsilon converges towards V strongly. Actually, uh, strongly in the sense that the convergence holds almost everywhere. Let's see. And now let me spend the last five, mi the, the last five minutes uh, explaining uh, what has to be done, which is really specific to this system, in order to conclude that you can pass to the limit. So at this level, there are actually two main difficulties. The first one is that, as you can see, inside the equations here, you have terms which are like UA epsilon times UB epsilon. So for terms like this, you have, the, you have to multiply two things which a priori only converge, converge weakly. So you need to get compactness. You need to know that UA epsilon also converges strongly not just V epsilon. So the first difficulty is to get compactness on UA epsilon and UB epsilon. Then the second difficulty is to show that in the limit, this quantity is equal to zero. And uh, uh, for that, you need to use in some way the one over epsilon some, somewhere. I mean, you cannot just work like we did up to here on the sum of the two things here. And on the last equation, you really need to have something <coughs> in which you keep the 1 over epsilon inside the, inside the computations. So it turns out that the, the answer to this question is uh, given by an unexpected uh, computation, which I will very briefly sketch, and which is on this board here. So the whole point is to find a good quantity which has, a, let's say, a quantity which has a good behavior when epsilon goes to zero in this equation. And it turns out, and it's a little miracle, that this quantity is the following. So this is what is called this E epsilon of t. This is a quantity which, as you can see, is made of the square root of u epsilon, u a epsilon divided by h and u b epsilon divided by k. And it happens that when you take the derivative of this quantity, and this is the computation which is here, uh, as you can see, you will, have to, you will have to take derivatives of V epsilon, which appears inside uh, the quantity. And uh, then if you want to bound terms like this one, you will have to use the fact that dt V epsilon is bounded in something. And here you already know but it is bounded in L2. So for the first part of the term here, the work consists in showing that the term which is here is also bounded in L2, and this is not very difficult because H, H prime, K and K prime are bounded by assumption, and UA epsilon and UB epsilon are in L2. So the square roots are even in L4. So this term can be bounded. And then, you have this second term here. And in this second term here, you can see that you have dt ua epsilon and dt ub epsilon which are appearing. So at this point, you must use the equation. That is, you have to replace dt ua epsilon and dt ub epsilon by, their, by the quantity which are here. So uh, I cannot, I have no time to do this whole computation, but I want to, um, I want to explain to you at least how you get out of that the compactness on the UA epsilon, UB epsilon on one hand, and the fact that this quantity will be of order uh, epsilon on the other hand. So look at dt UA epsilon, for example. You can see that uh, at this level, you have three terms. dt UA epsilon is equal to this one plus this one plus this one. Okay. This one 
uh, in fact, does not uh, change anything in the computation, so you can just forget about it. It can be bounded. So forget about this one. Then there is this one, the one with the Laplacian. So if you replace dt ua epsilon by the Laplacian here, and you do the same for dt ub epsilon, you see that you can do an integration by part, and you will have gradient in x of ua epsilon times the gradient of this, which you can expand, and you will end up with the gradient square of ua epsilon and ub epsilon, surrounded by many terms. Okay. Now, this is exactly what you need to get the compactness of UA epsilon, because you have, if you have gradient in X of UA epsilon and UB epsilon, once again, thanks to Relish's theorem and, in fact, Aubin-Lyon's theorem, you can really show compactness of those terms. Okay. So the compactness comes out of the diffusion terms which are here, which is quite reasonable, because you, the parabolic equation gives you naturally compactness in X, uh, and the, the second term one has to analyze is the terms which are coming from here. And here I would like to do the computation just to show to you how it works, because it's, I think it's really the, the heart of the computation. So I take this term here, and I just replace dt ua epsilon by the last term in the equation there, and I do the same for ub epsilon. So as you can see, what you end up with is 1 over epsilon uh, k of v epsilon ua epsilon minus h of v epsilon ub epsilon, like this. So this is what appears in, in, in the terms there. And you see that you have a minus sign in front of the ub epsilon. So actually, this one will correspond exactly to minus this one. So this is multiplied, according to what is here, by 1 over square root of h of v epsilon u a epsilon minus uh, 1 over square root of k of v epsilon u b epsilon, like this. So this is what comes out of this computation. And so you will be able to show that this quantity here is bounded. And since you have 1 over epsilon in front, this means that what is inside is uh, uh, like constant times epsilon. And now look at what is, what is inside here. You have something like x minus y times 1 over square root of x minus 1 over square root of y. Okay. And this is something, sorry, it's 1 over square root of y minus 1 over square root of x. And since uh, 1 over square root of x is a decreasing function of x, this quantity is in fact positive. Okay. And actually, you can show, for example, that it is bigger than x to the one-fourth minus y to the one-fourth to the square. But you can forget about this. <laughs> but the whole point is that this quantity is positive and it will be bounded by something which is decreasing like epsilon. So it tells you that all of this uh, will tend to zero in the end. And the only way for this quantity to be equal to zero is, that, is when x is equal to y, which is at the limit exactly what you need. Okay. So, uh, I will not do any more uh, computations here. Let me just explain the whole point of this new idea here. So, this is uh, what we usually call an entropy, for reasons which I don't want to, to present now, uh, but it's why it's called E here. And introducing this function here, it gives you both the compactness that you need and the limit that you need for, for this singular term. And as you can see, it is made in such a way that you have this very special structure at the end, like x minus 1 times 1 over square root of y minus 1 over square root of x. So the whole point of the proof is actually to find this quantity. That's the point I want to really uh, uh, clarify, that all the rest, all those uh, functional analysis things, 
There are things that you have in your, in your toolbox, if you wish, and you can extract them when you need them, but it's not really the heart of the, of the problem. The heart of the problem is really to find the right quantity which, when you take its derivative and use the equations, gives you terms which have a right sign like this one. So this is really the computation I wanted to show because of that, because it's really, ver it's really the very heart of the proof here. Uh, okay, so uh, now I see that I have uh, uh, used all my time, so um, let me say one or two words uh, of conclusions uh, about this. So the first thing is that, as you can see, uh, there are, um, strangely, uh, some issues uh, of modeling lead uh, to uh, rigorous proofs in the end of existence. So it's something that you can, uh, which is not really expected, but which I think is actually quite deep, that, um, and th that you can see in physics many times, that is that the, in fact, it is by understanding uh, quite precisely the modeling that you understand the ingredients which will make the proof work at the end. Uh, and maybe I can conclude by this. Uh, by the fact that uh, even if you're more interested in the, in, the structure, in the mathematical structure of the equations, actually to have a good idea of the modeling is really something which helps a lot uh, in the end. So let me, let me finish with that. 